Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled The Deep Dive into AAV Capsid Stability and Genome Ejection with Uncle. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speaker. Now the webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel which is on the right hand side of your screen and if you require any assistance along the way you can contact me at any time by sending a message using the same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode, and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Unchained Labs, who developed the content for this presentation. Unchained Labs is all about helping biologics and gene therapy researchers break free from tools that just don't cut it. Unleashing problem tackling solutions that make a huge difference in the real science they do every day. That's not only their mantra, but a promise, and they own it. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's event. Andre Mueller is the product manager for Uncle at Unchained Labs, supporting the development of new biologic and gene therapy drugs. His expertise covers fluorescence, static light scattering, and dynamic light scattering for biophysical characterization of proteins and viral vectors. His research experience spans from structural biology to plant physiology and across labs in Germany, Sweden, Denmark, and the USA. But now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our speaker for today, Andre Mueller. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you very much for this introduction, and thank you to everybody in the audience for joining my webinar, Dive Deep into AAV Capsid Stability and Genome Ejection with Uncle. Have you ever snorkeled? It is super nice to see fish, coral, and maybe even turtles underwater. In the picture, we have the Great Blue Hole in Belize in the Caribbean, and I'm not sure if I, want, I would want to snorkel, let alone swim there. The structure is about 400 feet deep and completely dark at the bottom. It always gives me personally an odd feeling when I don't know what lies beneath me in the deep, in the unknown, in the unexplored waters. When you're working with a complex analyte like AAV, you also want to find out as much as you can about it and its stability so there are no nasty surprises lurking in the unknown and causing trouble in downstream processes or trials. In, in today's talk, I will show you solutions we at Unchained offer to characterize many aspects of AAV using one single tool and to get to the bottom of AAV stability. When you're working with AAV, it is crucial to have information about their stability. After all, you work really hard to obtain nice and full capsids, and you want them to remain that way. When I say stability, I mean stability in thermal ramps, over longer periods of time, in isothermal conditions, and also stability in freestall cycles. In considering stability of an AAV, this is very much in parallel with um, any other biologic, the formulation of pores needs to be taken into account too, the formulation that the analyte is in. AAV formulations oftentimes contain surfactants to prevent adsorption, and peloxamer 188, also called pleuronic F68, is a common surfactant. What is the effect this surfactant has on stability of our AAV? That's what we will discuss today, and we will use one instrument to record the data, our uncle. Let me introduce that to you next. Our uncle combines three measurement modalities, fluorescence, static light scattering, and dynamic light scattering in a temperature controlled environment. In terms of fluorescence, we excite fluorescence using a UV laser and a blue laser, and then we record the full emission spectrum. That's how uncle can be flexible and can be used to study both protein intrinsic fluorescence and fluorescence of a reporter dye like Cipro Orange. Static light scattering is a function of molar mass, so by monitoring the static light scattering signal over time or over temperature, we can assess when that aggregation is proceeding and define an aggregation temperature. 
Dynamic light scattering sounds almost like static light scattering, but is fundamentally different. It does not measure molar mass. It measures the hydrodynamic size of our analyte. We can also use this, of course, to monitor or to, to look for aggregation. And UNCLE has DLS and SLS has two systems for aggregation detection. In terms of temperature, UNCLE uses a Peltier element and the temperature in um, the uh, sample can be set at, at any point between 15 degrees Celsius and 95. We can, of course, also ramp the temperature with the user selectable ramp rate. These three measurement modalities and the temperature control combine to more than a dozen applications in UNCLE and make it the one-stop stability and characterization platform. One very popular application that we will also use today is the TMT Ag app, looking at the melting and aggregation temperatures of protein. If you want to run a DSF or thermal floor experiment, UNCLE has you covered. We can do TM determinations using reporter dyes like Cipro Orange. UNCLE can also be used for isothermal and, of course, for biocapsid work, biocapsid stability work. That's what we'll do today a lot. And we can also only look at DLS and find out about the size of our analyte and the polydispersity or combine DLS with a thermal ramp and look at sizing and thermal ramp. We can use UNCLE to determine colloidal stability parameters like the diffusion interaction parameter, second barrel coefficient, or Kirkwood buff integral. You can use UNCLE for thermal recovery tests, viscosity measurements, and also for isothermal chemical denaturation. The heart of UNCLE is the sample holder, the uni. Um, the uni is an array of 16 quartz cubits of 9 microliters each that are held in this black anodized aluminum frame. As you can see, those cuvettes are open at both ends. That makes it really easy to load them. You uh, take your pipette tip close to the opening of the cuvette and then capillary force will wick your droplet right into the cuvette. The pitch, the pitch of the cuvettes is the same as uh, the weld in a 384 weld plate, so you can also use a multi-channel pipetter to load your uni. Open cuvettes make it really easy to load, but then of course when you run the experiment you want them to be sealed to not have to worry about, whatever, to worry about evaporation. Sorry. And in order to accomplish that we use this blue uni frame, so we basically insert that black uni here, close the frame, and then there's going to be two silicone seals that press against the openings of the cuvettes and seal them off. These silicone seals are disposable, uh, so there's no cross-contamination between runs. Uncle can take one, two, or three unis at a time for one experiment, so you can uh, analyze or you can characterize between one and 48 samples at a time. When it comes to viral stability characterization, Uncle covers the crucial aspects of both viral integrity of your AV and aggregation of your AV. Uncle and its light scattering capabilities can be used to monitor aggregation of your viral particle. So you use DLS and or SLS to identify aggregates, for example, before an experiment, or if you want to find out when aggregation occurs, you combine that measurement with a temperature ramp or a long-term incubation. When it comes to viral integrity, there are two pathways, two distinct pathways we need to consider. It's the capsid disruption pathway, and then there's the genome ejection pathway. Both of these make use of UNCLE's fluorescence capabilities. Now let's take a closer look at capsid disruption first. The viral capsid of an AAV is composed of proteins. Symmetrical structure, and then the inside of the AV is where we would find the payload. These capsid proteins can melt just like any other protein, and um, that melting of the capsid proteins will lead to a disruption of the capsid structure and it's falling apart. We monitor this behavior like we would monitor the TM of any other protein. The fluorescence of the aromatic amino acid residues in the capsid proteins will change with the environment that these residues find themselves in. So when we're looking at the emission spectra over a temperature gradient, that looks like this. This is the raw data of an uncle experiment, and this will set up to record one spectrum at every degree in a thermal ramp. In the beginning, the aromatic residues in the proteins are on the inside of the protein in a hydrophobic environment. As the temperature increases, the protein begins to melt and the aromatic residues are facing an increasingly hydrophilic environment. The 
aqueous buffer essentially that the protein is in. This leads to a change in fluorescence output. The intensity is reduced and we see a shift in the maximum emission wavelength. So from here, intensity reduces and it shifts slightly to the right. This is a red shift in this case. This fluorescence raw data can then be processed in several ways to um, make it usable in further analysis. What we can do in UNCLE is we can take a look at peak height, we can take a look at peak area, we can also look at ratios of different wavelengths. Our default analysis mode is BCM analysis, BCM standing for barycentric mean, and that is the wavelength that divides the area under the curve in two equal halves. The advantage of a BCM measurement is that it integrates over the entire peak, which leads to a high signal, low noise result. This is what the process data looks like. In this example, we're looking at the serotype AAB5, and in green on the left y-axis, we have the fluorescence, and in blue and on the right y-axis, we have the static light scattering signal monitoring aggregation. Uncle monitors these two signals simultaneously, so same sample and same gradient. We can see how both of these signals start rather flat and then increase at around 80 degrees Celsius. UNCLE software determines the melting temperature, which is the inflection point of our BCM trace, and then the aggregation temperature, Tag, which is the onset of aggregation. What we typically see for an AAB is only one melting event, and that melting event occurs in concert, or actually happens simultaneously with the aggregation of the um, capsid. So the melting of the capsid proteins triggers their aggregation. I will pick this one up later, so I want to underline it here. In an AAB, melting and aggregation are usually happening simultaneously. Before we're looking at more results in this case, um, for other AAVs, let me show you the experimental design first. In my work, I used three different serotypes, AAV5, AAV8, and AAV9. These were commercially available, and I used them in three different formulations. Uh, first formulation is uh, Dulbeco's PBS, abbreviated P. Uh, the second formulation is PBS with 0.01% poloxamer 188. This is abbreviated PP. And then the third one, PPS, is PBS with poloxamer and sucrose. When we look at the melting and aggregation behavior of the three serotypes, AV5, AV8, and AV9, in the three formulations they were tested in, we see that these parameters, so the melting and aggregation temperature, are quite specific to a certain serotype. This serotype specific specificity sorry, of melting and aggregation is also the basis of the AAVID method, um, the identification of the serotype based on its melting temperature. What we also see is that there is no clear trend of capsid protein melting and aggregation as a function of formulation. For AV9 here, I wasn't able to determine a melting temperature because the titers were a little bit too low. However, so a uh, takeaway here is that we don't see a clear trend of capsid protein, capsid protein melting as a function of formulation. Let's next take a look at genome ejection from the capsids and see if there's an effect of the formulation on that. To analyze genome ejection, we will use a reporter dye, CyberGold. This one increases its fluorescence output when more DNA is present. So we can use the fluorescence readout of the CyberGold fluorescence to assess how much payload has been released from the capsid. As UNCLE measures full spectrum fluorescence emission, we can very easily record this data. The raw spectra look like this. We see how the fluorescence of cyber gold increases with the amount of DNA being available. Um, what I want to point out here is that we are using the blue laser, the 472 nanometer laser, to excite fluorescence of cyber gold. And then we can also use the static light scattering from this experiment to assess aggregation. A typical process data set for capsulability looks like that. Again, we have fluorescence data on the left axis in green, and we have our static light scattering, our aggregation readout on the right y-axis and in blue. 
the fluorescence this starts at a non-zero value that is because there is some free dna present in virtually all aab preps you can of course try to reduce that amount of free dna by using benzonase or another dnas or by trying to purify it away but i left it in in my experiments here because i think it's also good to know how much free dna is present in the beginning this fluorescent signal then decreases with increasing temperature. This is a normal temperature effect of the interaction between cybergold and DNA. And then the signal starts increasing again as our capsid starts releasing its payload. This progresses until a maximum point when all the DNA is released. Um, the melting temperature here is then determined by the melting temperature of capsid genome release is determined by an analysis of the derivative. When looking at the static light scattering signal, we see how that is rather flat and then it starts increasing around 75%. And what I pointed out earlier when we we're looking at the capsid disruption pathway was that aggregation of um, viral vectors is usually happening simultaneously with the capsid proteins melting. So we can say that the capsid falls apart at around 75 degrees, whereas the genome is released at significantly lower temperatures. Uh, in this case, about 20 degrees Celsius lower. So what does this um, capsid release assay look like for our AAV5? When we look at one of the serotypes used in this experiment, AAV5 first, uh, the result looks like this. We have fluorescence again in green on the left axis, and uh, we have uh, static light scattering uh, in blue and on the right Y axis. Both of these are recorded simultaneously, and our fluorescence trace shows one, two, three inflection points. Uncle Software determines from derivative analysis what these inflection points are, and then uh, we have one at 50.6 degrees Celsius, one at 67.6 degrees Celsius. The third event, the third, in third inflection point here, is not a genome release, but it happens at the same time as the capsids are aggregating. So this is actually an uh, interaction of cyber gold with our capsid aggregates, capsid protein aggregates. So we have two genome release events, and then we have the third one um, that is indicating when aggregation occurs. We look at these results for the other two serotypes and the different formulations that we're in, we see two genome ejection events for AV5, one genome ejection event for AV8, and one or two genome ejection events for AV9. In this table, I did not call out the third or the highest melting temperature that happens in concert with aggregation, because that's not a genome release event, that's an aggregation event. What I also want to point out here is that these aggregation temperatures match the aggregation temperatures I showed you a couple of slides earlier in the capsid disruption very well. So um, that is um, indicating um, that this aggregation is not influenced by the dye that we have present here. What I also want to point out is that these payload ejection temperatures themselves do not show a clear trend with formulation. However, of course, What's interesting is that we see two genome ejection events for AV9 in the peroxamer containing um, formulations, whereas we only see one in DPBS. So let's take a bit of a closer look at these individual fluorescence traces from which these temperatures are derived. Here's the three fluorescence traces for AV5. The color scheme I used here is going to be used throughout. So the DPBS condition, the formulation P, is always going to be green. The formulation of DPBS with peroxamer, PP, is going to be blue. And then DPBS with peroxamer and sucrose is going to be in red. These experiments were set up and run in parallel and pipetted from the same AAV stock. So they are directly comparable to each other. What we see here now is that in the formulations containing peroxamer in blue and in red, the magnitude of fluorescence change in the first ejection event is much higher compared with the second. Whereas in DPBS in green, we have a small change in the first event and the bigger change in the second one. 
it seems that more payload is released earlier at lower temperatures in the presence of proloxima. When we look at the other two serotypes, we also see that more DNA is released at lower temperatures in presence of proloxima. In AAB8, the ejection is much more pronounced. See how much of a step this is and how little of a step this is. And in AAB9, that first ejection that is visible in presence of proloxima in blue and red here is not picked up in the green trace of DPBS alone at all. That's why the table earlier had only one uh, ejection event uh, for condition P, whereas it had two for PP and PPS for AAV9. These capsid stability experiments clearly show a trend to earlier genome release and hence destabilization of the capsids when proloxima is present. Next, let's turn from thermal ramp experiments to isothermal incubations and see what we can learn from those. In these isothermal experiments, I incubated my samples for 24 hours at a given temperature. These are five discrete experiments, so one incubation was 37 degrees, one was 42, one was 47, one at 52, and one at 57. Throughout these 24 hours, the um, fluorescence and the SLS data was recorded um, every 10 minutes. The results for AAV8 look like this. We can see relatively comparable behavior between the three formulations in the first three temperature steps. Uh, again, I'm plotting these side by side here for better comparability, but they are all individual experiments. So we see relatively comparable behavior in the three formulations at 37, 42, and 47 degrees. But at 52 degrees, we see there's a lot more free DNA in the blue condition, which is the DPPS with proloxima. And that, that trend continues in the 57 degree incubation. The TM of genome ejection in AV8 was around 50 degrees Celsius in a thermal ramp, so that kind of matches. What is interesting here and what I want to point out is that the sucrose containing formulation looks a lot more like DPBS, so it seems that the sucrose has a stabilizing effect on the genome release from AV8. In case of AV5, in the thermal ramp we saw two release events and the first one was at around 51 degrees that had a bigger magnitude in the presence of proloxima. And this is actually also confirmed here in the isothermal experiments. In the 52 degree incubation, we see how the two proloxima containing formulations have more free DNA over a period of 24 hours compared with the DPBS alone. In case of AAV9, we again see the destabilizing effect of proloxima. So look here at 47 degrees and at 52 degrees where the proloxima is clearly shows more uh, free DNA than the other two conditions. It also shows the remedial effect of sucrose because sucrose is behaving, or the, the sucrose and proloxima containing DPBS uh, could, behaves a lot like the regular DPBS. This is interesting also because it actually happens at temperatures lower than the temperature of a genome release that we determine in the, in the RAMP experiment. In all of these isothermal experiments, we see that PBBS, DPBS, sorry, is faring relatively well. It is never the worst in terms of payload loss. To summarize the isothermal results, the experiments show the destabilization of AAV capsids in presence of proloxima, which leads to an earlier release of payload. This isothermal result confirms the destabilizing effect that was already very clearly shown in the thermal ramp. However, these isothermal results also add nuance and information to the emerging picture in that they show that sucrose has a stabilizing effect on the capsids, leading to a reduction of the payload release in the isothermal experiment. All in all, the results up to here do not really recommend proloxima as an excipient, certainly not when it's used alone in PBS. Let's take a look at another interesting data set. When you have an AAV prep, you want to preserve it and its full empty ratio. 
usually you freeze it. And in the freezing, surfactants are oftentimes used to prevent absorption of the analyte, of the AV in this case. And uh, there is uh, recent reports of poloxamer having a stabilizing effect of, on AAVs in freestyle cycle. What can we learn by applying UNCLE to this question? The experiment I set up was using AAV8, uh, and I took out aliquots after zero freestyle cycles, one freestyle cycle, three, and five. Freestyle meaning freezing at minus 20 degrees Celsius and then thawing at room temperature. I then took those aliquots, added cyber gold, and ran a capsid stability test. What I'm plotting here is the free DNA as a percentage of total DNA. And what we see is that in the green P D P B S alone uh, formulation, we see a significant increase in free DNA already after the first freestyle cycle, so from 20% up to 25%. With 3 and 5, we eventually near something like 30% of free DNA. Whereas in the poloxamer containing conditions, uh, blue for poloxamer and DPBS and poloxamer and sucrose in DPBS in red, we see no change. This is a relatively derived plot. The increased payload release during free star cycles is actually already visible in the capsid stability traces themselves. Let me show you that. So these are the individual capsid stability traces overlaid, and in green, the condition of DPBS, you can see how after zero and uh, one free cell cycles, we are in here, and then after three and five, the amount of free DNA increases as a function of free cell cycles. For the poloxamer containing conditions in red and in blue, we see that the ones that have sucrose in them are all clustering nicely together. In the case of DPBS with poloxamer after five free cell cycles, we also have a slightly increased amount of free DNA, but nothing like what we would see for DPBS alone. All things considered, I just showed you the effect of poloxamer as an excipient in your AAV formulation and how these effects of poloxamer need to be balanced. Poloxamer has discrete effects on AAV in that it destabilizes the AAV and causes payload loss already at lower temperatures. However, in a freeze-thaw cycle, the prevention of aggregation to the surfactant has a stabilizing effect on your AAV. Sucrose, in contrast, has a stabilizing effect in all tests that I showed you today. It can remedy the poloxamer effect to a certain degree and it also adds to freeze-thaw stabilization of your AAV. This data shows that the effect of different excipients in the formulation need to be balanced against each other to optimize stability of our analyte. This is true for AAV and poloxamer, as it is true for, for example, monoclonal antibodies in arginine, where arginine is really good at preventing aggregation, but it's not good at preventing unfolding. In order, to, in order to solve this formulation balancing act, you need a reliable and flexible tool to characterize your analytes and formulations. UNCLE is this tool, your all-in-one stability platform. Much like this intrepid snorkeler who's finally balanced in a stable position above the great blue holes of this, with the information from UNCLE, you can balance your AAV stably. And you have plenty of data to show that there are no monsters lurking in the deep. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. I'll pause and see what questions we have in the chat. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. I would like to invite our audience right now to continue sending their questions or comments using the questions window for this Q&A portion of the webinar. Also, I'd like to direct your attention to the handouts module within GoToWebinar control panel, where you'll find some additional documentation related to today's presentation to download for some further reading. Now, I've already received some questions, though, so we'll get ourselves started with those. The very first question that I have for you would just simply like to know what is needed to run UNCLE. Thank you very much for this question. Um, you need, of course, UNCLE itself. You need a computer. We provide a computer with UNCLE that runs the software, and um, software comes in two parts. It's a client software that controls the instrument, and an analysis software that is used for analysis. 
And then you need the unis, you need the consumables. So you have the blue frame, which is reusable, and the consumable itself is the silicon seals with the, um, the array of quartz cuvettes. Now, of course, you don't have to use all 16 at a time. You could use the first uh, cuvette of the uni today and the other 15 tomorrow, um, and um, then you're good to go. So uncle, computer, and the unis is what you need. That's excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I have here is wondering, is it possible to quantify the amount of free DNA in the sample before the thermal ramp? Yes, it is. Um, it's actually happening as a default setting in the capsule stability application. And that measurement is also the basis of that bar chart I showed of free DNA um, as a percentage of the um, total DNA. So um, the software or the, 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 the application is set up in a way that it measures the fluorescence at the beginning of the experiment and then at the end of the thermal ramp. And the end of the thermal ramp, of course, is the total DNA. Beginning is the free DNA initially, and that's um, how you can derive that information. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next question here uh, would like to know, how can we interpret uncle fluorescence data? Uh, what is BCM? Right. Um, uncle is flexible in the interpretation of the fluorescence information. You can analyze for peak height, uh, for peak area, for ratios of wavelengths, and also for BCM. BCM is our favorite, if you want, uh, because it is a very high signal, low noise information due to the fact that it integrates over the entire peak. So it is basically uh, 120 wavelengths by default. You can change it as the user and it uh, finds out what the um, wavelengths that separates that area under the peak into equal halves is. So because of the integration of 120 wavelengths, it's a high signal, low, low noise comparable to an area measurement. So um, all of these uh, processes, all of these analyses are run and you as the user can toggle between them when you're analyzing your data. Very good, excellent. The next question here is curious, why is full spectrum fluorescence necessary to characterize AAV stability? Yes, so full spectrum uh, fluorescence emission is necessary to characterize all aspects of the stability of your AAV. You want to know the uh, protein intrinsic fluorescence in the shorter wavelength emission um, to find out when is the capsid protein uh, melting. And you want to be able to use um, a reporter dye like uh, a cyber gold to quantify the release of the payload. So the full spectrum um, gives you or an instrument that records full spectrum fluorescence gives you the necessary flexibility to fully characterize uh, the behavior of your AAV. Wonderful, thank you. The next question I have here, I would like to know what is the relevance uh, to look for stability above 42 degrees Celsius? When we were developing the isothermal applications, we noticed that sometimes isothermal um, stability or Sometimes the stability parameters or stability behavior we see in isothermal tests matches what we see in thermal ramps very well. Sometimes we get very interesting and different results out of it. So um, what I was trying to set up in this experiment was a sweep over different isothermal conditions. And um, that's why I was slowly edging my temperature up five degrees in every one um, to see and characterize the stability. Of course, in a, in a physiological context, temperatures above 42 degrees are not necessarily going to be occurring. But in order to characterize the stability, I think it is still important to look at um, those higher temperatures. All right, very interesting. Thank you. Now, what if the capsid stability TM is higher than 95 degrees Celsius? Um, the technical limitation in Uncle is. Um, setting a temperature using the Pelletier element between 15 degrees Celsius and 95 degrees Celsius. So uh, we will not be able to monitor it um, at higher temperatures than 95. Um, mm -hmm. I think that Th should answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. I think you may have just mentioned it, but what would be the minimum temperature that uncle can go? Yeah, that's uh, 15 degrees. So um, 15 degrees Celsius to 95 degrees Celsius. So uh, physiologically irrelevant. Um, and then also the temperature range in which most proteins uh, would show uh, melting. So 15 to 95 is the range. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question here asks, what about uncle and other viral vectors, uh, adenovirus? Yeah, um, it's um, we have 
users. We have customers using it for adenovirus and also for anelovirus. Um, we developed our methods with AAV, adenovirus associated virus, simply because it was uh, available. I mean, it's, it is commercially available. Um, adenovirus is a little bit harder to come by, but these methods that I showed are not only applicable to AAV, they are also applicable for AV. All right, excellent. So next then, the question here I have here is wonders, can we use UNCLE in a GXP environment? Yes, we can. Um, so uh, UNCLE can be qualified, so we can do installation qualification and also operational qualification. And then there is a mode of the software that is 21, or that, that is um, designed with 21 CFR Part 11 compliance in mind, so it would offer an audit trail. Fantastic. Good to know. Thank you very much for that, that in-depth answer to all of our questions. We've got another one here. Uh, they're asking, is it possible to assess capsid stability according to pH? Absolutely. Um, the um, wetted materials in UNCLE in the uni are quartz glass and silicone. So you can use a wide variety of pHs. What I did today, uh, or what I showed you today, it was all based on uh, pH 7.4, but um, I think your creativity is the only limitation to the formulations you want to try. And so using different pHs is definitely possible. We have tried some things with lower pHs um, and um, that is interesting data and that may be used in an upcoming webinar. Definitely possible to try and, and test the dependence of genome release or capsulability in general um, as a function of pH. Perfect. Thank you very much for that answer and for all of the answers today. Uh, however, we've reached the end of the Q&A portion for this webinar. Now, if we can attend to your questions, the team at Unchained Labs will follow up with you. Or if you have further questions, you can direct them to the email address that's up on your screen. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now, I've also sent you a link in the chat box, and with this link, you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page, and you can also share this link with your colleagues who can also view this webinar when they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now please join me in thanking our speakers for his wonderful time here today. We hope that you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day everyone and thank you for coming. Thank you.